Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. I want to talk about five reasons why low thyroid supplements can backfire, why they can be a bad idea. You know, there's many thyroid support, thyroid boosters, thyroid glandular products in the market, and people realize that their thyroid function is critical. You know, it's the big needle mover for metabolism, mood, energy, um, health, brain function, all sorts of big things. And there's also a pretty clear sense that just what's done commonly in medicine is not enough. You know, people are given Synthroid, they're not really given detailed testing, um, not given a lot of care always into finding the root causes as they should be. So there's a lot of folks that know they need thyroid help and are frustrated and want to go further. And many people have made products to try to fit that need, to try to serve that, that audience. But the drawback is these things can have some implications. I want to talk about those. Now, one scenario that comes up quite a bit is that there are, there are over-the-counter glandular thyroid supplements. Uh, Thyro Gold is a big one that's been out for quite a while. There's many others you can find in stores and on Amazon. And if you look in discussion groups or whatnot, they're talked about as being things that can be used instead of thyroid medications. You know, they're actually the same kind of a raw material that natural desiccated thyroid, like a WP thyroid or armor thyroid, it's the same stuff, really. You know, it's, it's desiccated thyroid tissue. It's often bovine-derived, so cow-derived versus pig-derived. And there's two things you hear about those. One is that, oh, there's no active hormone. We've lyophilized. We've pulled out the hormone. Or the other one is that behind the scenes, they'll say, oh, there is active hormone, and here's how you want to convert that. You want to take, you know, six of these pills to equal 30 milligrams of an armor thyroid, for example. You'll hear, you'll hear that. Well, the drawback is that this one's definitely not true. This one's kind of true, but not consistent. So the idea of removing the hormone from that, I've talked to people that actually are scientists that make thyroid tablets, and they've said, we don't know how that could be possible. <laughs> There's basically not a way you could do that. So, and then there have been some assays done. You know, a group of scientists a few years back went out and just bought these things and then assayed them in a laboratory. What they saw was that nine out of 10 had measurable amounts of T3, and five out of 10 had measurable amounts of T4. And the range was huge for both. Um, some were actually giving quantities of T3 way more than 10 micrograms per day. And some had T4 as high as 100 micrograms per day, just about. And that's, that combination is a lot. That's more than most take from prescription medicines. So to take multiples of those a day can be a, a big overdose. And then the other drawback is that the amounts were not consistent, even from within the same product when it was tested at separate times. So if they were just consistent, maybe it would work if you could work out a formula. But the drawback is, even if you found an amount that made you feel well and gave you decent lab results, that we'd have to figure it out all over again next time you had to refill your batch. Or even within the same batch, the tablets are not consistent. So that's a negative. The other big negative, there's a thing called BSE. You may have heard of mad cow disease. This is also called bovine spongiform encephalopathy. There is a human variant called creutzfeldt jakob syndrome. And there's organisms, well, I guess organisms is a debatable term. There's things called prions, which are even more simple than viruses. And they're found in cow brains. So mad cow disease spread because cows were were killed with high impact to their head, which would send brain tissue around the carcass, and then other cows were fed off of cow carcasses, and cows can't break that stuff down. So nasty stuff, but that's how that happens. Now, with cow bovine glandulars, the brain tissue in that, you could also have prions in that. And there have been case reports of that being a possibility. The downside about BSE is that it's something that in humans, it just rots your nervous system, and it may do nothing for 15 years. It can be totally latent, and then 15 years later, you've got this disease that's just untreatable and on a train train wreck. So that's a drawback about bovine, bovine um, glandulars in terms of bovine thyroid glandulars, but also bovine glandulars that have bovine pituitary, bovine hypothalamus, or bovine brain tissue. They're all things that can show up in that, and even bovine parotid because it's close enough to that cavity to where brain tissue can spread. That was number one. Number two would be just iodine. So 
there's still uh, a vague idea that the thyroid needs iodine, which is true. And it seems logical that if you need it, then more must make it go faster. It must be like hitting the gas. That part's not true. It's more like a spark plug. If the spark plug's gone, the car can't work. But pouring in 50 spark plugs doesn't make the car faster. It actually does the opposite. <laughs> and that's how iodine works for the thyroid. So many supplements have known about there being a vague relationship, or manufacturers have known about there being a relationship, and they've wanted to have that be a popular ingredient to see on a thyroid supplement. The drawback is you end up getting above range for your iodine needs. Now you need some, you definitely need some iodine. Uh, I, I don't wanna to go too far and argue that you need none because you need it. There's a sweet spot that data is really strong, too little is bad. But if you're on thyroid meds, you're actually getting a little or maybe even a lot already. So most, like a one grain dose of desiccated thyroid or a 100 microgram dose of T4, that's about 130 micrograms of iodine right there. And your sweet spot per day, based on the largest compilation of data, is if you've got Hashimoto's, is probably about one to 300 micrograms per day. So if you're on thyroid meds, they alone probably put you to the sweet spot, the lower to moderate end of that sweet spot for iodine dose. The other consideration is that you'll always get some iodine in your diet. The one exception would be raw food vegans. They can get extremely low in it. They can get to be less than 50 micrograms per day. But unless you're raw food vegan, you're probably getting around 100. A typical range is about like 70 to 150, 200 micrograms per day in your diet. So that's there, plus your meds. You're edging to the high end of the sweet spot. You're close to getting over that sweet spot. So every amount you take in addition to that may be pushing you to where your thyroid's getting less responsive and more inflamed for reasons that are very controllable. So yeah, you want to avoid things that give you extra iodine, even multivitamins. Number three would be folic acid. So many supplements in general and many thyroid supplements have folic acid in them. And folic acid is a synthetic version of folate. Now folate's super critical. Our bodies need that for stabilizing DNA and for so many important reactions in the brain, the liver, the immune system. But the drawback is that people that have thyroid disease pretty much always have gene defects for folate metabolism. We call this the MTHFR gene defect. And because of that, folic acid not only doesn't work, but it gums things up. It makes things not work at all. You know, imagine like a key that doesn't quite fit and it breaks off and sticks in the lock. And now you can't put the right key in. So that's what folic acid does. And it also raises the risks for colorectal cancer. So you want to avoid that one. Number four, I, I do see this happen sometimes and that's getting an overdose on selenium. Now, some supplements just have a lot by themselves. They've got just far more than you need and that happens. The other thing that's more common is that people may have multiple things they're taking that have selenium in them. And selenium is a lot like iodine in respect to that sweet spot phenomena. You know, you need some, too little is bad, but too much is bad and paradoxically, it's often bad in some of the same ways. So selenium deficiencies can raise risk for certain cancers. Selenium excesses, guess what? <laughs> yep, they can raise the risk for certain cancers. I've actually seen people that had major toxicity from high dose selenium. And based upon their symptoms and their general blood chemistry, I thought they were being lead poisoned. And I learned later that it actually looks quite similar. But luckily the tests that I did were broad enough, I wasn't suspecting it, but the test luckily was broad enough where selenium showed up as being way off the charts. So you can overdose on selenium. <laughs> Shoot for about 200 micrograms per day, 300 micrograms per day for supplementation. I wouldn't exceed 600 micrograms per day from all sources. So don't go above 400 for supplementation because a good healthy diet, you're probably gonna get at least 100, maybe 200 micrograms from that. And Brazil nuts are ridiculously high in that. So they're a nice adjunct to reasonable dosing, but you could be indiscriminate and consume many a day plus higher amounts from supplements and just go way over the edge. So don't do that. <laughs> Last number five, big issue with a lot of thyroid supplements is that I see many that have trace mineral concentrates. And you know, I just looked this up about a lot of these supplements, and their ingredients. I didn't think this stuff was used that much anymore, but I was very wrong. It's common and it's in many of these products. Now, 
way back when there was a, this was like, I'm dating myself. This was the early 90s. There was a cassette tape called Dead Doctors Don't Lie. A gentleman named Joel Wallach, he's a colleague of mine, kind man. But he sent this tape around and it was just a huge, it was viral before the internet. <laughs> and he argued that people lived to be 150, 170 years old in these various populations because they drank liquid, they drank water that was full of min minerals from glaciers. And he argued that along with the common minerals we think about, like um, you know, calcium, magnesium, zinc, that all the minerals on the planet are actually essential for us, that we need all you know, 72, he would argue, of these various minerals you can find. And he made liquids that contain that. There were concentrates of inorganic minerals. Well, the drawback is <laughs> the data is strong on about a dozen minerals being essential, meaning that you get sick and bad things happen without them. But they've done in the past, you know, the whole idea of discovering vitamins and minerals was quite a, fa quite a phase, you know, with, with scurvy and the B vitamins and a few minerals. There was a period of time in which that was the hot thing to do in research, was to find the next essential substance that living things just couldn't flourish without. It was a hot topic in science. And they, they plumbed that well dry, in all honesty. They did many studies that were fruitless. Um, there were some that were looking at cesium deficiencies or rubidium deficiencies. And these are things that we consume naturally in crazy trace amounts. But they would set up animal tests in which they got zero of these odd obscure elements and saw, hey, are they going to get sick? And they didn't. They, they really had no clear effects. So there probably are a lot of obscure elements that we get exposed to that small enough amounts are likely harmless, but we don't actually need them for anything. <laughs> and the drawback about these concentrates is that they actually are concentrates, but if you look at the ingredients, they'll tell you they've got aluminum, they've got lead, they've got mercury, they've got fluoride. Those are bad for you. Those are harmful for you, and you want to avoid those. So that's a negative about the trace mineral concentrates, which you see in a lot of the thyroid supplements. So Dr. Christensen here with you. Hopefully you've got a happy thyroid. If you're not clear on where yours is, check out the thyroid quiz and get a track on your current score and get some tips on how to make that better. In the meantime, take wonderful care of yourself and we'll talk in really soon.